I joined the police 16 years ago. I've always been interested in the law. And then when I left university, the police was a natural choice. I started as a response officer in East Bristol. East Bristol contains the three on-street red light districts of Bristol. So that's where girls loiter on street corners and curb crawlers drive around the streets. So very quickly, I was introduced to on-street prostitution. And then from that, I was introduced into human trafficking. Estimates suggest the number of people trafficked into the UK has jumped tenfold in the last decade. But it's often hard for police to identify the victims, unless they get a lucky break. I was in the centre of Bristol. A vehicle had hit one of the automatic number recognition cameras, and it was shown as having no insurance. I responded by going to look for the vehicle. I could see in the back of the car there was a, a girl, very quiet, wearing a dressing gown. My gut feeling was that something wasn't right. I smell a rat, basically. If you run this vehicle through NPR, please, um, just see where it's been. There's a, a female in the rear in a dressing gown uh, and a suitcase. So just given what you told me, um, we're just trying to bottom out what's going on. This is the first time in 13 years I have stopped a car with a female in a dressing gown in the back. My initial reaction was, she's a sex worker, but then I had to sort of try and determine whether she was doing that willingly or whether it was something a bit more sinister. OK, listen, you can just put the cigarettes out for me, guys. What they told me was that they had gone to pick her up from the train station in Bath, but I was aware that the trains didn't come into Bath at that time of night from London. I had a girl in a dressing gown with a train ticket from London that was bought at lunchtime and the train didn't arrive in the station at the time of night that we were at. Therefore, suspected that they'd been driving her around to essentially make her work. Right, guys, at this moment in time, you're both under arrest on suspicion of human trafficking. Police had a possible victim, but they needed evidence. They also needed to know how the traffickers operated and if there were more victims. Operation Beryllium was established to investigate. DC Dale Morgan was one of the lead officers. Prostitution in the UK is legal. A girl working on her own for her own personal benefit that provides her own place to work is perfectly fine. It can't happen in a public place. Then it becomes illegal. So then you move off street into the brothels and it's the person that controls the brothel that then commits the offence. While we don't mind prostitution in the UK, we don't want people being exploited. So we don't want women and girls being forced into prostitution or having their prostitution controlled. And you can't control prostitution for gain. The Beryllium team had just 24 hours to build the case and unravel the financial trail before the two male suspects would be released without charge. But they were still to hear from the victim herself. When I walked into the room and I saw her for the first time, she's in a dressing gown and there's a suitcase on the side. And she's actually just waking up from lying down on our sofa in our canteen. I thought she was far too young to be in that situation. She initially said she wanted help, she wanted support. She didn't want to be a sex worker anymore. She wanted to leave prostitution and return to Romania. And, and we said, yes, we can, we can help you do that. We can take you away from this group. She then agreed to be interviewed. She was a little reluctant, so the interview didn't flow quite as a victim interview would normally play out. There were elements more like a suspect interview because she was very cagey about what had happened. We had to delve a little deeper into what happened in her life over the last few months and how she had arrived in the UK, ended up as a sex worker in Bristol. She hadn't been a prostitute before she arrived in Bristol, and now she didn't want to be a prostitute anymore. The story the 19-year-old shared with officers was typical of women tricked by human traffickers. She told us that she had known one of the suspects from Romania itself. She had gone to Germany, where she was working as a waitress, but uh, she needed more money. 
she made contact with the, the male suspect online. When they started chatting, he said that she could come to the UK, be with him, he would be her boyfriend, he would look after her, and then that they would make money together. It's a process often termed a lover-boy approach. Come with me, I'll love you, I'll take care of you. She came in via a car, via a ferry, spent one night in a hotel. The next night she was in the brothel and she was working as a prostitute. The victim's recorded testimony was the first piece of evidence. But Operation Borellium immediately had a problem. After the interview, though, she had changed her mind. She didn't want any more police help. She said she just wanted to leave her own way, take her own path out of the UK. The police had a very small window to build a case and charge the suspects. We've got two people in custody and we can't hold them forever. We are going to have to release them within 24 hours or something else has to happen. In my experience, if we release them on bail, nine times out of ten, Romanian pimps are going to be on a ferry back into Europe and vanish within 48 hours. We wanted to charge them and remand them in custody. We had to pull together an investigation team quite quickly. We had the financial investigation unit looking at money laundering and asset recovery. We had an analyst within the Intel Development Hub looking at the phone work and, and trying to track where mobile phones have been. With the clock ticking, Operation Borellium made an incriminating discovery. Very quickly, it was established that one of the men in the front had previous conviction in Romania for a like offence to human trafficking in sex workers. The team quickly analysed the victim's police interview to understand how the exploitation worked and where it happened. She would estimate about six men a day she would see. The average was £100 for a one-hour in-call at the brothel, and, and our estimates from that, she was making about four grand a week. All the money made was given to the pimp. The victim was working out of two addresses in Bristol. Within the first 24 hours, we went to one of the brothels. It was clear there are three women there working together in one building. It is therefore a brothel. With only a few hours before the police would have to release their suspects, the operation made another surprising discovery. We found out that the boyfriend was married. We located the wife, and we very quickly established that this was a husband and wife controlling prostitution, controlling brothels, and the husband had a mistress. Our victim was one of, the, one of the sex workers within the brothel. We then applied for an extension to keep the two men in custody up to 36 hours. The 12-hour extension was granted. That day, I worked from 8 o'clock in the morning to gone 10 o'clock at night, trying to gather all the material. Their accounts, I think they were just trying to come up with something to sound innocent. And they had no knowledge of this prostitution. They were just giving a lift to a girl that asked them for a taxi ride, basically. They were providing a taxi ride. I'll, I'll take your ID in a minute as well. While the men were denying everything during their interview, text messages from potential clients were recovered by the police. With that information, we could then see what had actually taken place earlier in the day. Painstaking analysis of CCTV and their mobile phones revealed their exact movements before being stopped by police. We could see the call from the person in the hotel to the pimp. He's asked for two girls overnight. then going and picking up the girls that were coming back on a train from London. Taking them back to the brothel where they change. And then driving them out to the hotel where the punter is waiting. 
that showed the control that they had. The call would come into the pimp's telephone number. They would then get a sex worker and take the sex worker to the out call. That, in essence, is human trafficking. She then calls the pimps to come and pick her up because she's had an argument with her friend. They've picked her up and they're driving back to Bristol with the girl in the back of the car, which is when they're sighted. The case for physical control was building, but Operation Beryllium still had to find evidence of financial gain. We found suspicious activity happening on their accounts, 100 pound payments being sent in with various different phrases attached to it. It's just lots of money coming in constantly. 160,000 pounds had gone through one of the female's accounts. There is usually a matriarch, a female in charge, that controls the money and controls the business. It's something odd that I've seen a number of times. The boys can almost be just the thugs. The muscle that does the trafficking takes the girls out in the car, takes them to the different clients. With only 20 minutes before the police had to release their suspects, they finally had victim testimony. Proof the men were transporting girls for sex and making a financial gain. And the identities of two women running the brothels. We then went to the CPS and asked them for charges for human trafficking, controlling prostitution and money laundering. One of the pimps, the one that had a conviction in Romania for similar offences pleaded guilty very early on. And the other suspects, having seen all the material that we were presenting, all three of them pleaded guilty. The first female offender was jailed for 23 months, suspended for two years, for controlling prostitution for gain. The second female offender was given a 12-month community order for using or possessing criminal property. Marin Gagori was jailed for 21 months. And Alexandru Ditta was jailed for two years, both for controlling prostitution for gain. The real win, though, is going to be the proceeds of crime and recovering their assets. And we're going to take back around £25,000. They've made a lot of money through controlling other people's prostitution. They've not had to do anything. They've not been having sex with six men a day to make all this money, to make thousands of pounds. I enjoy working on these cases. It is helping a victim that didn't want to be in that situation. She didn't want to be a prostitute anymore. After we met her, she wasn't. She returned to Romania. She's escaped that, that world. County Lines involves illegal drugs being transported from one area to another and sold via a specific mobile number, the County Line phone. There are currently estimated to be over 600 organised County Lines gangs operating in the UK. Knife violence is endemic to this type of drug crime. Every year, police forces nationwide coordinate one week of action to target the biggest county lines dealers in their region. Just seen some dude come over to the car and leave again. A drug dealer has taken hey, place. Calm yourself down! All right. In 2021, that week fell in May, and our cameras were there. I joined the police when I was about 25 years old. I done voluntary work within the police, working really on my weekends when I wasn't doing my normal job, which was fixing coffee machines. I'm 12, 13 years into my career as a police officer now, and I still wake up and enjoy coming into work every single day. Surrey police face a constant battle with drug gangs from London who target their county. Operation Viking was specifically set up by Surrey Police in order to have a dedicated unit 
to target the organised crime, which is county lines drug supply. During intensification week, we identified that there was an address that was being cuckooed. We figured out from farm work and intelligence that potentially some males from London had attended an address and taken it over. The term cuckooing is used where people take over a vulnerable person's house and they will then use that as a base in order to supply drugs. So they will prepare drugs, package drugs and sell drugs from the addresses. The whole team really got together in order to try and identify who the person in charge of the drugs line was. The team brought together for the operation included Ed. Ed is a covert police officer whose identity remains protected. I'm lucky enough that I've ended up on some proactive teams that focus on drug dealers and some nasty people that come down from London into the counties. Sergeant Dan Heborn from Surrey's Divisional Support Unit was also on board. Divisional Support Unit is myself and 10 officers, and we deal with all the warrants, the drugs warrants, firearms warrants, all the high-risk arrests. This is the Enforcer. This is a hooligan tool. We use this for breaking glass. We can also wedge doors open. This is a fairly new bit of kit. But we can use this for cutting doors. We can cut through metal with it. The team planned a raid on an address they believed had been taken over by a drugs boss called Jaden Gregg. He was already known to DC O'Neill. Jaden Gregg was a person who I'd previously dealt with as a police officer uh, many years ago, probably 10 years previously. Um, he was a dangerous character back then, and no doubt that things hadn't changed. He was a street robber when I was young in my career and someone who would frequent on a daily basis uh, on the streets of Croydon. And when I heard the name, you know, it didn't really knock me back too far to think that he would be the type of person who'd now uh, take up this type of criminality. Greg was from London and had recently been released from prison after serving time for stabbing a man in the head. He was a highly dangerous individual. Surrey police were joined by Met Police, who knew Greg well. There's some fast-time intel come in that there are two IC3 males in the address. They are supposedly in there with a load of drugs and the line phone. This is the subject premises here. Marlock will do the main door. Guys, if we go double ram, Melv and Ollie, I'll take the enforcer with the saw as a contingency. If we've got any real emergencies, we'll get a firearm pulled, then back to the van, we'll try and maintain cover. Cool, happy? Yeah. Right, we're pretty much good to go, yeah. mate. I think the biggest problem we have is you just never know what's going to happen. It's really soul destroying because I don't think people realise how much work goes into executing warrants and getting to the point where you're ready to go in, you've got the resources available. When you turn up at an address and you know you've missed people by minutes. It's quite common that if people have got something to hide and don't want us to be getting in quickly, they'll barricade it. So hopefully there's going to be some form of drugs and cash inside. It was clear that the address was being used by a Class A county drug line to deal drugs from. Hidden in a lampshade was a large amount of heroin, 40 grams, which has a rough street value of around £4,000. But with no Greg or members of his county line's gang caught in the property, the police were still one step behind. It's all well and good kicking down a door and getting some drugs, but investigations aren't like that anymore. Drug dealers are getting smarter. Investigations are getting harder. So once we're in the property, we like to slow it down. On this occasion, we're looking for 
bits that would link individuals to that address. We found various mobile phones and on a review of the mobile phones we could see or identify a person who was sending messages which appeared to be directing people so that would be the person who we'd call a line holder or the person in charge of the drugs line. He was referred to on that mobile phone as Slitty. The police dug even deeper into the possible evidence at the scene. During this search, a games console was located and found in the address to be plugged in, which is unusual and was clearly taken there by the persons using the address. We had the name Slitty as being a potential nickname or street name for a person involved. We were able to turn on this games console where we were able to see that the account logged in was also under the name Slitty. Also linked to this account was an email address. That email address gave it a name, and I immediately identified Jade and Greg. Also uncovered were incriminating photos that placed the suspect in the property. And showed large amounts of cash. Right here, lady. It's called candy. Candy from a baby. From a baby. Brr. With the help of the games console, Evidence against Jaden Gregg was building. But his whereabouts was a mystery. The next day, Operation Viking and Met Police hit the streets of Croydon, where the suspect had links. He's not been out of prison a long time for a serious assault, where he stabbed people in the neck and stabbed people in the head. I have previous experience with this gentleman, and he was a bit lively back then. The operation had teams searching different streets. And finally, one unit spot the suspect. Get on the floor now, you will be tasered. Get on the floor. Get on your knees. 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 Get on your you're not, no? Yeah. OK. With Jade and Greg in cuffs, the police search him, his associate, in the flat they had recently left for evidence to support drug dealing. There's a like miniature scales there, isn't it? Fine. Is that there? One, two. Okay, just before we step into the bathroom. You've grown up a lot since I've seen you last. I arrested you for a robbery in about about twelve years ago. On a bus. Just got off a bus. Yeah, yeah. He was arrested. Jaden Gregg was charged with supplying Class A drugs, intent to supply cannabis, and the possession of a knife. He was sentenced to a total of five years. It was actually quite reminiscent to see uh, Jaden for a second time when we'd arrested him. You know, he hadn't changed his ways. He was still up to criminality. He's a person, a very dangerous person, who will no longer be on the streets of Surrey to commit further crimes or exploit any further persons. In Britain, during the COVID pandemic national lockdown, overall crime dropped. But cases of fraud didn't stop as they adapted to the new reality. The huge sums of money in medicine mean the industry is a very natural target for fraud. 
The NHS falls prey to more than a billion pounds of fraud every year. During lockdown, 6,000 cases of new types of COVID-related fraud and cybercrime resulted in £34.5 million pounds of losses. City of London Police specialise in all types of fraud investigation. I joined police in because I wanted to make a difference. I didn't want the normal nine to five. I wanted to go and do something that made an impact, made a difference. City of London Police is the lead force of fraud. We take on the most difficult and complex cases around the country. I've worked in lots of different fraud backgrounds. I've also worked in murder investigation, domestic violence, street gang crime. With more people at home during the COVID pandemic and the streets easier to patrol by police, fraudsters adapted the way they operated. When the pandemic struck, it came with a, a huge amount of, of different challenges for policing in general. We still couldn't let the criminals go unchallenged because very quickly in the pandemic, there were COVID-related crimes emerging. Just goes to show criminals will make money out of anything. One case that made national headlines during COVID was urgently handed to Detective Inspector Ives. This was the first case that we had taken. Certainly in my past career dealing with street crime and violent crime, it was on those levels of cynicism and nastiness that this crime was committed. On the 30th of December, the victim answered her door. The offender was stood there with a lanyard claiming to be NHS and claiming to be administering the vaccine. It was told to the victim that she needed to pay them just over £100 for the vaccine. Then the offender entered her premises. He put something sharp against her skin and then took the money and left. This was a standout case for the unit. The risk to the public was higher on this case than any other case we had at the time. And it was very, very clear that we had to deal with it quickly. A wave of fake COVID jabs could have undermined public trust in the legitimate vaccination programme. City of London established Operation Freesia to stop the fraudster. My role within the team is head of the unit and head of operations. All of the day-to-day -day operational planning will come down to me. The actual work of kicking the doors down and, and getting the handcuffs on, we've got a really, really good and effective team that do that work. The tactical lead on the ground was Peter Garland, a really experienced detective. He's super competent and he never fails. I have a penchant, I suppose, for economic crime because there's lots of powers that we have under the Proceeds of Crime Act to take money off villains. And quite frankly, that's where it really, really hurts them. On the 30th of December 2020, the victim elderly in her years, mid-90s, received a knock at her front door. You know, we were at the height of a global pandemic. By virtue of her age, the victim is vulnerable. Bit of trickery at the door, so she let him in. She believed him, took her into her lounge, asked her to roll her sleeve up where he placed a dart-like instrument against her skin. It's important to say that no vaccine was administered. The victim was asked to pay. She went uh, upstairs, got 100 pounds in cash. He told her that that wasn't enough, and so she found another 40 pounds in cash. He then said that she would get reimbursed by the NHS, and then he left the premises. But the vaccine fraudster didn't stop there. Within a week, he revisited his target. On the 4th of January 2021, the mail turned up at her home address, saying that she needed to pay him more money for the vaccine. He saw her as an easy target. She'd realised then that this wasn't real, this was a fraud. It was a shocking crime to decide to commit. To her credit, she got him out of there. She told him where to go. The victim contacted the police. And it was because of that quick action that the police got on the hunt. What had been alleged was something that we couldn't allow to happen again, even for a single day. This wasn't an easy crime to fall for. At that time, elderly people above a certain age were waiting for that call. Recent data suggests an elderly person falls victim to fraud every 40 seconds in the UK. The elderly generation are very trusting of people. They prey on that. 
you know, that provides the mechanism for their offending. It was difficult not to feel angry, to put someone's life at risk for just over £100. They don't just target one individual. They might do half a dozen houses over a day or two period. They would potentially be spreading the virus. That's why we targeted resource and we stopped our other work for a period of time. I had to convince the organisation that I could solve this in seven days with the team. It was a challenge. You make no mistake, this was an old school manhunt. No matter how determined officers were, they had an immediate problem. We had very little to go on. There was one piece of rather grainy CCTV image to work from. The fact that we had an image didn't tell us who it was. He's one of hundreds of thousands of people in and around the London area. It was clearly a community-based crime, and so the answer was to lay in that community. Old-fashioned police work, knocking on doors, basically. Were you at home? Did you see anything? Was anything unusual? Anybody out of the ordinary in the street? It's quite a close community in that part of the world, and neighbours look out for each other, which is something that doesn't happen everywhere. It is not the public's job to do the police's work. But we can't, with cases like this, necessarily identify a suspect without the public's help. The only way we were going to get a name for that person was to go loud on press, was to invite the public. Do you know who this person is? Let us know. Let us have it. We'll work through it. Operation Freesia resorted to the age-old tactic of a public appeal. The case was so shocking, someone was likely to, to want to tell us who he was. An appeal can generate lots of leads. But sometimes that's a problem in itself. The press appeal was wildly successful and elicited a very large number of responses. That's what you want to see. When you have a large volume of information incoming like that, there is always a concern that the, the right information will get lost. If the wrong suspect was filtered out, then we would have lost our man. Every day that we hadn't identified this person was a day that they could be knocking on other doors and putting lives at risk. It was urgency, but it was a, a real professionally calm but fast-paced working environment. There were a lot of officers working on this job. We were following up leads, we were conducting bank inquiries, CCTV inquiries. We were doing all sorts of different things to try and link people to the area. CCTV is an investigator's dream and an investigator's nightmare. It can give us a facial image of a suspect, it can show us how an incident has unfolded. But to sit and go through that footage is ours. You can fast forward a little bit, but the danger of fast forwarding is you miss stuff. Three days into Operation Freesia and the pressure was immense. So every name that we got followed up on. Do these individuals have any previous convictions? Have we got a custody image? Narrowed that down really to, to one individual who, who roughly matched that on the CCTV. We would not have got evidence without the knocking on doors. We had got a name both from the public and as a result of inquiries with CCTV. Quality can be different, but when you've got really distinctive things like haircut and clothing, and you can tie down an individual to a location, then it can be case solving. The suspect's name was David Chambers. He had previous convictions, so the police had an address for him. That sealed the deal. There he was. That's who we needed. We just had to find him. We were following every lead that came in, following up CCTV inquiries, trawl hours and hours and hours of footage. That would in turn identify a suspect and provide us just that little snippet that we needed to tie in with other evidence that we had. And we were very fortunate that we established that the suspect may have gone to visit a pharmacy. So we attended that location. We struck lucky with the pharmacy. On the CCTV was our man. We had him on CCTV in the area on the 30th, 45 minutes an hour, something of that order after that first offence, wearing the clothing as described by the victim. It's too coincidental for that not to have then been a person of interest. Although we knew who we were now looking for, finding him was a very different thing. There was no time wasted. We had immediately gone to David Chambers' address. He wasn't there. Large family group there told us that they hadn't seen him, didn't know where he was. The side effect of a press appeal is that the suspect knows you're after them. And at that point, this individual tried to cut all ties uh, with any traceable addresses or, or people. He had gone on the run. This was a major setback. You go door to door until you find him. It's police work, isn't it? 
With the suspect on the run, officers began visiting his previously known haunts. At this point, I didn't have that long left with my huge resource before I had to be redeployed again. A modern manhunt involved lots of old-fashioned policing knocking on doors, knocking on acquaintances, families' doors, putting professional pressure on that suspect to know that the police are out there and not giving up. This situation couldn't run on for two, three, four weeks. So we brought in the Metropolitan Police, who have a specialist dedicated manhunt team. I was confident that we would make that seven days. Doesn't mean there wasn't pressure, though. There really was. He knew he was wanted. Friends, family, associates must have been telling him, police are looking for you. And he went to ground. And we spent the next little while really trying to find him. Every little tangible address we could possibly link to him was called on. Late Thursday night, half past 11, midnight, we found him at an address in Surrey. An address that wasn't previously recording on any of his records. The net closed with the city police team, with Pete, with local units from Surrey Police and the Metropolitan Police, all converging on this one address at the same time. I was sat literally next to the radio, definitely nervous. Standing in front of him, he was the person on the footage. He absolutely matched the description. There was definite pride at that point in the whole team that, that we'd call him. The game was over for him. He looked like a broken man. He was actually very polite, very courteous, meek, mild, yes sir, no sir, like butter wouldn't melt. It was clearly him. That first stage of getting that danger off the streets was complete. We arrested him, brought him back to Bishopsgate custody where we conducted interviews with him. Operation Freesia were ready to put their evidence in front of Chambers. He gave a no comment in that interview. Didn't want to talk. Didn't have the decency to explain what he'd done. Following morning, he was subjected to a further interview. Uh, he didn't answer any questions then either. Frustrating, but I was satisfied we had enough to charge him. I wanted him to stay in custody. We couldn't release him, we couldn't bail him. It had been a nightmare to find him, quite honestly. We needed to keep him in custody for public safety and to prevent him from disappearing. He went before a magistrate who also saw fit to keep him in custody. David Chambers was charged with two counts of fraud and one of common assault. After a seven month wait in custody, he finally came before the courts and was sentenced to three and a half years in prison. David Chambers changed his plea and pled guilty. This just gives you a bit of a measure of the man, really. We've got a vulnerable victim. He knows the victim's vulnerable. He knows how old she is. Yet he puts her through further stress, further anxiety. He should have just pleaded from the off. We knew we had the right person, but to have that confirmed and cemented in place with a guilty plea, it is a big moment for the team. He was sentenced to three and a half years custody. And alongside that was a seven year criminal behavior order. The criminal behaviour order will mean that the defendant can't do door-to-door -door sales. Cold calling people's addresses, either in person or via telephone. He can't leaflet drop, solicit for work. And unless it's an emergency, he cannot just go and, and bang on somebody's door. If they do, they're liable for arrest immediately. A great result for the team, for the victim, and for the police in general. All that hard work, all that effort, all of those hours, on behalf of the victim, it provided a little bit of closure.